welcome to County Board Wrap Up. I'm your host, Kara O'Donnell, and today we're going to be talking with County Board Chair Jay Fazette, as well as Board Member John Vistad about some of the important decisions the Board took at its July meeting. Decisions that affect you, your family, and our community. Jay and John, thank you both for being here this morning. Now, the board took a couple of actions related to Virginia Hospital Center's decision to acquire the county's Edison Center property on George Mason. Right. Let's talk first about the decision to acquire the hospital's property on Carlin Springs Road as part of this deal. It's kind of a convoluted process sure. here. Actually, we did it just today, this morning. We were here just into the wee hours of the morning, uh, left around 12.30, and uh, the hospital representative uh, was here as well, sitting with us the whole evening. Uh, really, this generated by the hospital's needs to grow. It's a huge asset for our community. They, you know, have the uh, very few options in terms of expanding their, their uh, footprint. And our Edison site uh, is immediately adjacent. So it was a year or so ago we came up with a memorandum of understanding that basically said we are very respectful of their need to grow. We're going to try to work it out. We're going to give them our property in exchange for either money or some of their land. And we did some due diligence on uh, their largest piece of property in Arlington, which is the Carlin, South, uh, Carlin Springs site that a lot of people know about. And uh, we actually invested our Joint Facility Advisory Committee to do some of that legwork to help us assess the feasibility, whether it had uh, the kind of value that we could use it for some of our community needs. Uh, and while that hasn't been determined, what it will be used for the determination from JFAC, the recommendation to the county board, was that uh, we should uh, do that swap as part of the deal with the hospital. And last night we, uh, we had a deadline in which we had to get back to them to let them know if that uh, Carlin Springs site was going to be something we wanted to come into ownership of and obtain, and uh, the board said yes. Uh, again, we don't know exactly how we will use that site, uh, interim uses, long-term uses, but we do know that uh, over the next year as the full deal is finalized and the full value of our property on the Edison site off George Mason is realized, whether in cash or other property, we will come into ownership of this site and I think it's a good thing for the community. Now what was attractive about this site in particular for the county? You know, one is its flexibility. Um, there are a whole range of possible uses. But also, land is at such a premium in the county, and we learned this through the community facility study. Um, we have a very t you know, tightly compact 26 square miles. We have a growing community, both schools and population as a whole, increasing needs both for storage and active uses and parks and many, many other community amenities. So having this in our inventory gives us some flexibility to meet those out year demands. And you know, and I think it's important, Kara, to, to stress that uh, the JFAC, as, as Jay mentioned, um, is composed of both county board appointees and school board appointees. Yeah. There really is a unified cross-county group of about 20, 22 citizens who right. are serving as a filter and uh, a sounding board for what we might do with any of the land that we might choose to acquire. And mm -hmm. I'm glad you brought that up because this is actually one of the first big implementations of a decision from JFAC, correct? Uh, what's, I mean, the role, the importance of the role this group is going to play? They, um, JFAC uh, meets periodically, much more than our standard, uh, you know, boards and commissions that may only meet once a month. As I said, it's composed of, of folks of all ages, all neighborhoods across the county with a cross-county outlook. Um, we, tr we try to get away from any parochialism. Sometimes that's difficult. Uh, but uh, staff, uh, both school board staff and county board staff uh, or county manager staff have been, uh, you know, brief the JFAC periodically. They're, they're stuffed with statistics, maps, documents uh, about the various properties that we're looking at or might consider. We want their creative ideas and I think we're, I think uh, the, the prevailing view is that we're working well together. Uh, they've made some, some potential recommendations for us and, and we're going to scrub them further and, and take a careful look. And in the first year they really focused on this short term. It was a short term project about whether or not the Buck site off right. Quincy and this site off Carlin Springs were worthy of our owning. Um, and then some ideas about how to use them, no, no final decisions. But in the long term their job, their mission is to look at not only the short term but really the midterm and longer term planning for the facility uh, needs of the schools and the county. Sure. 
kind of the eyes and ears on the ground type right. thing. Right. And the only nuance I would strike is um, w with in connection with this swap, it, it, it could be simply an exchange of land or a combination of cash and land, and that, that remains to be determined. Exactly. And I know you said no decision has been made as of yet as what we're going to do with this Carlin Springs property, Correct. but what are some of the things that are being discussed? What are the options on the table? Well, I, I mean, I would just say maybe as a predicate to that, that, that the land does have some constraints. We're very mindful that to the immediate west is Carlin Springs Road. Um, it's traffic challenged. And I certainly believe that, you know, before we really make any final decisions or do anything, that we're going to have to deal with the traffic and, and, right. and streetscape issues. I think every option looked at the back of it at a minimum being connected to the existing park. Some right. of that because of topography and, and just natural, you know, the natural landscape. And then on the front side, you already have a building that has some uses in it. We have to figure out how to sustain those for a transition period, maybe. Uh, the hospital will be working on that. Um, uh, and then beyond that, there are Department of Environmental Service needs, there are school needs, public safety needs. All of those are still to be resolved. Okay. Well, we'll stay tuned on that. But on a related note, John, you know, as a part of this deal, the hospital center is going to get the Edison Center property, but that's going to cause some problems for the county's Head Start program. So we had to make some decisions there. Right. Uh, so what we decided last night uh, was to acquire a property uh, not far from Route One on South Glebe Road, uh, and you know, child care is at a premium in this county. I mean, we do. There are not enough child care providers, and so we're working hard to work with that community. Uh, and my colleague Katie Crystal actually has launched a new initiative. Uh, where we're going to try try to uh, you know assist that community, uh, but the building that uh, we acquired, uh, we're going to be retrofitting for Head Start. Um, now this isn't at at sole cost to the county because Northern Virginia Family Services, which has been tapped by the federal government to run Head Start, will be making rent payments to us. But finding a site was a challenge. Um, you know we don't have a lot of uh, places, frankly, that are for sale or for lease. For a, a child care center, you want something that has easy in and out for parents and caregivers, uh, adequate parking, uh, and you, you will want a place that has either has green space and a playground or the potential for that. So it was tough. Okay, and well, we'll stay tuned on that as well. But let's talk a little bit now about another rather convoluted, controversial issue that it was a topic of this month's meeting, and that's the Lever Run Community uh. Center. <clears throat> now, we approved the final concept design, correct? No. Okay. Did not. Then tell me what, what actually happened in the wee yeah. hours of the morning. Yeah, you got to catch up on this one. This is breaking Great news. Breaking yeah. news. Yeah. Yeah. Breaking news. Actually, um, we went into yesterday's meeting, and to set the table on this, this is uh, the oldest community center as far as I know. It's, it's uh, off of George Mason uh, Drive. Uh, it, the, the building needs a lot of work. We've known it for a long time, and it wasn't worth rehabilitating. Uh, so the plan for many years has been to replace it with something much more functional that can house some of our Parks and Recreation staff again, they had been there years ago, and provide a far uh, better set of amenities, uh, gymnasium, etc., for the community. Right now it's a, it's a fairly small old building and then a very large surface parking lot. So we've engaged uh, the community, the, the Parks and Recreation staff have really tried to do a very robust, kind of different um, outreach process in engaging folks in the, in the thinking and the design and the functionality of the building. Uh, we have a fabulous architectural team uh, brought in. Uh, and we've made a lot of progress, and I think everyone will agree we made a lot of progress, um, even though last night we did something a little, uh, a little different than the manager had recommended. We did award the contract for construction, and part of the challenge in this whole process that has been really hard, I think, for everyone to get their arms around, board members, staff, community, is we're using a different procurement process than we've ever used before. And instead of doing a, a, a design and then a refined, you know, a detailed drawing and then putting it out to bid to build exactly to the, to the, to the you know, nut, nuts and bolts what you want, this is a more fluid and flexible where some of the risk is being shifted to the um, contractor because we've set a dollar limit. This is the box. You can't go beyond that in terms of dollars. So the architects are working with the community and the staff to get the concept design, the massing, the height, the basic building the uh, footprint. footprint. Yeah. 
but the contractor would be brought on to then go in and value engineer and, re and design and bring some creativity to accomplish our goals with that building, but within a fixed dollar amount. And in the past, you didn't have that. Sometimes you stayed within budget, sometimes you, you had overages. So um, in this case, what we did last night was we did award the contract, but we didn't officially uh, uh, endorse the concept design. Okay, the specifics of the and design. And there's only okay. one reason for that. I think the board spoke un unanimously about this. We left the process open and because we were trying to stick more with what the original process was. A few months ago it was laid out. We actually tried to embrace what had been put out there before because as time went on there were some changes, some miscommunication, some lack of clarity I think from by some of the you know, stakeholders in this about what we were doing last night. So in the end, we left open that process for feedback, but we also put some limits on the range of that feedback. We're not looking at an overhaul of the concept design. We're looking at more tweaks and nips and tucks, but we want the community to have that say and that input over the next two months. And yeah. in September, we will have it come back to us, probably the building, but also the, the exterior, the, the uses on the parkland, which hadn't been refined yet. Uh, the, there were there were a number of concerns that we heard both about the process and the substance and and Jay's right we're not looking at a radical redesign but we've heard from some of our commissions our Park and Recreation Commission our Environment and Energy Conservation Commission uh, and so forth that you know what can we do to maximize preservation of mature trees what can we do to maximize green space both uh, and and natural areas. And we want to make sure that those bodies, which are an integral part to our planning process in the county for so many things, are just adequately heard and briefed. Now, is there any concern with this new way of kind of doing this contract with that fixed price that at the end of the day, if something comes in above budget, that something we really want is not going to be able to be included? It, it, it really can't unless it's... Um, unless it's an add-on that okay. we decide. In other words, if we decide to add a particular feature that was not in the original scope, then right. yes, we can go back and add it. But if it's something where he's coming back and he's saying, gee whiz, you know, the price of tile has gone up in the meantime, there's not going to be that opportunity to come back to us and okay. say, well, I didn't think it was going to cost this much, sorry. Right. Um, so that's called the Construction Manager at Risk, CMAR, uh, uh, procurement, process. procurement process. What yeah. kind of things can the public still weigh in on? I mean, mm -hmm. we, we talked about yeah. that obviously you can't, we're not going to redesign the entire building at right. yeah, this late game. And I what think, kind of things can I think John be? sort of hit on it. Um, if you go back to the community facility study of two years ago, um, there was an aha that came out of that. And that is that we're a constrained community with limited land and we have to build up and under and be as efficient and do joint things to take advantage of the limited resource. So this one, this proposal um, does that to some degree, but some people were wondering, could it do it more? So you take that surface parking lot, you put parking underground, you create open space on top of that usable green space. A huge improvement. You actually expand the building substantially to serve more people. And so the design functionally of the building makes it, is important too. Um, if there was one thing that a number of people raised, uh, it's can we save more trees? Can we reduce the footprint as it expands toward the park, uh, toward the trees? And I think that's the area where we as a board said, we'd love for these architects to listen to the community in that regard. Maybe someone has an idea. Is there a way to nip and tuck and improve that aspect of this? We're not talking about a fourth floor now. Okay. We took that off the table. So you can't just go straight up anymore. It's already you know two floors above and one floor, floor below. But that, I would say, is where we ask for more, more uh, uh, leaning into the issue. And in fact, there's uh, a c another community meeting tonight uh, at Barrett Elementary, directly adjacent to Lover Run, which is going to uh, tap uh, sentiment and, and discuss uh, the, the park and the, uh, the exterior of the new community center. Be careful though, if we run reruns of this, it won't this be tonight anymore. <laughs> oh, okay, so, right, right, right. We're talking Wednesday night, uh, July uh, 19th. There we go, right, there we go. Right. All right, good to clarify there. Well, the board took many more actions at its July meeting, but we're going to take a short break right now. But when we come back, we're going to take a look at some of those other contracts the board approved. Stay with us.
Welcome back to County Board Wrap Up. I'm your host, Kara O'Donnell, and we're here with Board Chair Jay Fazette and Board Member John Weistat talking about some of the key decisions the Board took at its July meeting. Now, we talked a lot about some contracts and that kind of in the first segment, but there were many, many, many more to be discussed at this last meeting of the summer, so to speak. Um, let's start with North Carlin Springs Road Bridge and the replacement of that bridge. Why is this bridge being replaced? Well, it, it's actually our oldest bridge that hasn't had any recent upgrades or, uh, or rehabilitation. It dates back to 1961. We're talking about the, the bridge, of course, at George Mason Drive and, and Carlin Springs Road. Uh, so we're going to be doing a, a complete uh, a redo uh, of the bridge. And we're also taking this as an opportunity to deal with some needed sewer infrastructure in the neighborhood. We're going to be going from the old 18 inch diameter pipes to 30 inches. Uh, and that actually is gonna provide some contracting economies as well because we're doing two projects together, less disruption to the neighborhood. Uh, it'll be a more attractive bridge. We're not talking about any fancy embellishments, but it'll be both functional uh, and more attractive. Uh, we've reached out to the community starting all the way back in 2012 for some uh, design ideas. Uh, our staff is actually uh, in conversations now with adjacent civic associations about detour plans uh, and pedestrian safety during this project, which is going to kick off this fall and be done the following winter, so almost a year and a half. Okay, now one th this is a very heavily trafficked bridge, about 20,000 vehicles right. a day. What can people who use this bridge on a daily basis expect in this time? Uh, we're we're uh, in the process of notifying civic associations in the community about detour plans, as I say. And I also want to stress, uh, we're not shrinking this bridge. The bridge is going to still be four lanes. We're adding um, wider uh, pedestrian. pedestrian and bike paths to the bridge. So I think from a, a multimodal perspective, it'll be both not only more attractive, but more functional as well. And this was all something planned out in the um, capital improvement program, correct? Right, right. You can, in fact, if, if somebody uh, needs a, a sleeping pill at night, they can go through our CIP, <laughs> our capital improvement program uh, book, uh, and see what we're planning in the years ahead. So they can make their own plans. For right, right. Cure that in some, yeah. <laughs> Are there any other bridges the county's considering replacing in uh, there's the a near few term? There's a few bridges in Roslyn. Um, we get uh, periodic reports about the safety of our bridges. This bridge, by the way, is not unsafe. It's just deteriorated, but it's not structurally unsound. Uh, but uh, there's a method to our, our uh, madness, so to speak, and, and we're, uh, we're constantly upgrading our bridges. We, you know, we just did the Freedman's Village right. Bridge at Washington uh, Boulevard. Boulevard and Columbia Pike, and uh, I think that turned out extremely well. Great. Well, we board also approved um, a contract for some much-needed renovations to Stratford Park. Tell me a little bit about that. Sure. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll jump yeah. in on this mm -hmm. one. Um, you know, the the park staff had hoped to get this started earlier, but as the schools looked at the Stratford School, and we realized they were going to be expanding it, um, that we all thought it was best to integrate the two processes and make sure we didn't jump ahead. Um, so uh, this has been on hold for us a, a little bit, but it's moving forward now, and this park hasn't had renovations in a long time. Uh, as you know, we have a very well laid out um, maintenance plan and, and refurbishing plan. Our parks get looked at on a regular basis. Um, people will see new, new playgrounds, new park amenities on, on a fairly regular routine basis. This one's getting a new diamond, new tennis courts, uh, lighting, all of the above. And so it is also designed to complement the, the new school. middle school. Mm -hmm. So I think it was a really good process, ultimately, of coordination with the schools in this one as well. Now, is this something the community is going to have access to these new fields once they're completed, when the school is obviously not using it? Sure. There is not a school field that is only used for schools. I mean, that's one of the things that's been a part of our uh, the way we do business for decades, um, it's only becoming more intense in recent years as the school population and the county population continue to grow. But every school facility is a community facility. The fields are used, uh, prioritized for the students during the needed times, but they are also scheduled and, and used by the community at large, as are many of the interior spaces of those schools. The, the other thing I would just mention, Kara, is that there's going to be a unisex bathroom built as part of the new Stratford renovations, the which, is, which is going to be accessible to park users. You don't have to go into the school. It'll be accessible from the exterior oh, okay. of the new school building. 
it'll be nice for the folks in the community using it. But also, speaking of fields and folks, we're going to replace the turf field that's over at TJ. So turf field, uh, you know, we, we are trying to move in the direction of transitioning our earth fields to turf fields to synthetic turf. And, and by the way, I should point out that, you know, we're mindful of, of the community safety concerns. This is not a crumb rubber uh, field composition. It's, it's the latest and greatest. Uh, so we're excited about that. But that turf field at TJ, Thomas Jefferson Middle School and Recreation Center, heavily used, it's been about eight or nine years. It's just time for uh, renewal. Sure. Uh, but of course, doing this every eight or nine years is, is, is certainly much more cost efficient than having to groom a field with every, the conclusion of every game. Right, or every rain. Right. right. Uh, and, and the other piece is, I come back to that community facility study, which put a focus on the value of land. It's a dozen, 12, 15 years ago, we started really doing these alternate surfaces, and the, the purpose was to get better use. Lower maintenance costs, more hours of usable time to meet the community needs. And it, so it really is a win-win. And they weren't received, you know, um, they weren't embraced initially by everyone, but at this point in time, I think um, uh, very well received in the county. I think once you've experienced it, you need to kind of see it firsthand to really yeah. see the value of doing something yeah. like that. And much field. lower maintenance, honestly. Absolutely. You know, it rains and you, you can't use the natural fields. They, you know, they're washed out. So the amount of time that they're truly available to the community is far less. Okay. And, and, and you know, longer seasonality, too. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I mean, speaking of the land use, a big part of that is conservation. And it was a neighborhood conservation project that was approved for North Sycamore Street. Right. NC, Neighborhood Conservation, uh, the project was informed by the neighborhood, the Williamsburg Civic Association. Uh, you know, the value that we see in the NC program, even though it does need some tweaks and, and reforms that we're looking at, it's really a, a bubbling up type of thing where the neighborhood gets together, decides what sort of infrastructure might be most important to them. Uh, a boulevard is going to be constructed up and down Sycamore at about 26th Street going north. Uh, and uh, it will be a landscape boulevard with uh, grass, street trees. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not sure, yeah, median. Uh, I, I don't know, Jay, if offhand, if there's going to be any rain garden component to that or not. No, I, I, you know, I don't but, know offhand, but I'm almost presuming when I use the term median, that these days when we use a median, it's for stormwater management. So and, I'm, I'm presuming. And, and in fact, um, Patrick Henry Drive is, is probably the closest other example that I right. can think of. Uh, you know, it's not the Champs-Élysées of Arlington, but it looks pretty good. Um, and it has the byproduct of slowing down traffic, uh, reducing noise, and, uh, and improving property values. And, and some of the newest improvements we've made on Patrick Henry has included a rain garden component to it, mm -hmm. uh, very attractive. Uh, so uh, we're looking forward to that. Now, is there concern though with this project taking it from four lanes down to two? I, I don't think so. I've, I've actually talked to a lot of people in the community about it. It's it's very very wide. We're going to be able to accommodate pedestrians uh, and and bicyclists in a in a more safe uh, and attractive fashion. Uh, and buses as well. So I think it's a win-win for everybody and those we don't always have those circumstances. That's true. Well, and last but certainly not least, we have a new mixed-use development for Crystal City with the new apartment building. Let's talk a little right. bit about that one. Sure. I think it's 24 stories mm -hmm. and it's at the corner of Crystal Drive and 23rd Street. Uh, right now it's a low-rise mm -hmm. uh, building, really retail and a little office. Uh, and this is, I think, um, very much in the, in the uh, spirit of our Crystal City sector plan, uh, which was adopted some years ago. And part of the purpose of that plan, sort of embedded in it, is to help improve the balance of jobs and housing in the core of Crystal City. Um, we know that certain neighborhoods, Roslyn and Crystal City in particular, are very heavy on commercial. Uh, so that um, Crystal City, the more people we can get living downtown and create a better balance, the more vibrant and sort of 18-hour activity sure. you find. So this is a very attractive uh, residential building. Uh, it'll be on top, sort of a podium above the existing retail that's there. Some people may remember Buffalo Wild, Wild Wings, Wings, I think, the, is yeah. up that corner. They'll be staying through this. This sailed through the process, honestly. Our Planning Commission, Transportation Commission, neighbors, 
Um, everyone that looked at this and, and had some hand in shaping this, as we always, you know, as we always do, um, came out and supported it in mass. Uh, so uh, I think in the long run, it's a win-win. It'll bring some of those residents to the core, able to take advantage of the restaurants and the amenities, and bring a better balance. Uh, attractive building, uh, and well within the plan of what we had originally approved mm -hmm. for this kind of site. And the only question that, that loomed at the end was that some neighbors felt um, we should be thinking uh, in a different way or a more creative way about how we assess the transportation impacts, uh, traffic, metro, um, the multimodal uh, impacts of, of our projects, both on the block and on the sort of larger area. And, and that's an ongoing effort. There's, there was a lot of conversation about that at the table. And, and, I, and I, we are looking at beefing up our, our traffic demand management and our traffic studies uh, across the county, actually. The, the other thing I just love about this building is that, that, it, that it has a green roof. Oh, good. So neighboring high rises, people looking over, looking down, have a green roof to look at rather than gravel. And there's, yeah. and, and Jay, you can take your dog over there. There's going to be a dog run. There you go. There's going to be a dog yes. run on the roof. And, you know, there's really no dog park um, close to Crystal City. So this will, this will assist at least residents of that building and I think it's something that we really want to encourage all developers yeah. to consider for new buildings or renovated buildings. Sure. I know that they have a couple of other highlights about the building. They're using a very high energy efficiency uh, system in Syria to the building. It's cutting edge so we're all very happy about that in terms of meeting the, the goals of our energy plan. And there is an open space, a park, a modest little pocket park at the corner which is being retained. It was not necessarily to be retained in the plan, but uh, in leaving the building footprint where it is and going straight up, we actually have a much nicer amenity at the corner with some, and they will, they will upgrade this park, sort of put some tables, chairs, and a little activity in it, which will be very nice for the community. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of another County Board oh, wrap-up. No, I we're know. done already. We're done already. Oh. Thank you, Hard Jay and John, for you joining bet. us today to shed some lights on the decision the board took at its July meeting. We hope you've enjoyed our chat with the board members. And remember, all the county board meetings are open to the public. And you can find the schedule and information on speaking at a board meeting on our website at countyboard.arlingtonva.us. To learn how you can get involved or make yourself heard on the issues, visit topics.arlingtonva.us slash engage. That's our civic enga engagement webpage. And that's where you can share your ideas and learn how to get involved in county issues. The board takes a summer break in August, and as a result, so will we. So you have a great summer, and we'll see you in September.